all you. Sales, location, condition, competition, planning. What's going on, everybody? Good morning. Howdy. How are you today? This is Wendy. How doing? Hey, Wendy, how are you? Good, here. There, there she go. is. Hey. How are you? I am doing great. Today's the Perfect. last day of Ignite. Well, it'll be the best day. <laughs> yes, the best and the worst day. So yeah. it'll be sad and happy at the same time. Well, cool. I know you guys have been learning a lot. Hey, Keith, are you on there? Yes, I am. I still have uh, my note to myself about the question you asked the other day. So I have not forgotten it. I don't know that I'm going to have an answer for it, but I just wanted you to know that I hadn't forgotten it. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you remembering it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I've got it right here. Is there reno money for seniors to get their homes livable for old age? Yeah, and, and the fact is, um, here's, here's, you know, here's sort of what I know about it. Um, it's, it. It may be that that money is not available you know, through conventional mortgage instruments. Um, I've, I've looked into it a little bit more. Apparently that money is available from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, and there's cash out refinance options if that works for somebody, but it's not specifically, it sounded like what you were talking about was something pretty specific. Yeah, yeah. The, the context that, that I'm familiar with is that, um, um, you know, through Medicare and Medicaid services, which is, you know, tied in with Social Security, you can actually go to them and, and they will provide money, a lot of money to upfit a house so that a person can age in place because it's less expensive than paying for them to live in, uh, you know, one of the different models of care that are appropriate for senior living. Yep. So, Makes I mean, that's, that's kind of a useful tidbit. So if you've got some people who are, you know, you know, maybe some seniors who are downsizing or something like that, and, and they're concerned about the house being as accessible as it needs to be, and about how much it would cost to make it, you know, compliant with ADA, which is kind of like building codes, you know, they're really just minimum standards. Um, you know, the, the useful information that we could provide to them is, you know, well, you can get money from Medicare and Medicaid services to make your house accessible. Gotcha. So go ahead and buy the house and get a mortgage. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. If you can find a house right now, that's the challenge. Is if yeah. you got, uh, especially newer agents, if you can get listings, that's like the golden coin of the realm right now. I mean, any if you can list houses for sale and list them at the right price. Um, I mean, Michael was wanting exactly. me to get about. So, uh, I mean, I think that it's, you know this, you've been told it, so that's the key. So am I heading this thing up or is there a, a leader on here? Are we a leaderless mob? I guess it's me. Well, cool. You guys are stuck with me today. It's 11, oh, I'll give it another minute. I got 11.04. <clears throat> There's Missy. Daisha, Daisha, I did a pre-approval for you yesterday, right? Oh, did you? <laughs> Who called you? Uh, I think you and I were going back forth on emails, were we not? No, uh-uh. But I thought um, I 
have a customer that might, was going to try to. Don Bruce. No, yeah. that's not me. You're talking to me. This is Daisha. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I said, yeah, Daisha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's reached out to you yesterday. So hopefully that yeah. goes well with her. Yeah. Does she All already right. submit everything to you? No, I don't know that we've gotten anything from her yet. Okay. So we'll keep you posted. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, I will go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you guys for being on here today. It looks like there's a good handful of us on here. So what I would like to do is um, I'll introduce myself and then just a little bit about the various uh, mortgage types that you guys will be dealing with. So I'm, I know some of you, uh, my name's Reed Clark. I've been uh, one of the Alliance partner lenders in the office there for right at 10 years. Um, and it's been a great blessing to me to be in there. And it must mean that we've done a pretty decent job if we've been able to stay in there that long. At least that's the way I look at it. So um, Bruce Gwynn is also a Silverton loan officer who's in there. You'll see his name on the flyer that I'm gonna share in a minute. Bruce has actually been in the business longer than me. I, I'm in my 16th year and I think he's at year 20 or 21 in the mortgage business. So there's a lot of experience there. Um, okay. Let's see, Regina asked me to record it. So the host has to give me permission to record. So whoever the host is would have to do that. It's showing recording on my end. I can see a recording. Okay, button. cool. So somebody's probably recording it. Yeah, I see it too. Yeah. Okay, well, cool. So uh, anyway, we're there. I'm there in the office. Uh, generally speaking, I'm in there several days a week. Now during COVID, it's been a little bit different, um, but I'm available, you know, too much of the time. Uh, if you need me, you can usually get me or one of my team. So I've got, um, there's four of us on my team who handle loan applications. And then there's five more on the backside once a loan's gone under contract that actually takes a file from there to close. And so you've got a, a strong group of people to help you uh, complete your transactions for your clients. And the way we look at it, guys, really uh, is it's almost as though you're entrusting me with your paycheck for 30 days. That's really what's happening. When you give me your purchase client, basically you're saying, all right, Reed, you're responsible for getting me the closing table and therefore me getting paid 30 days from now. I mean, we're not a nonprofit, right? We're doing this uh, because we get paid. So that's the one way, that's the way we look at it. We take it super seriously. Uh, when you guys give us uh, a client referral. So what I want to do now is I'm going to share my screen. And before I get started, do you guys have any general questions or do you want me to go over the loan types and just let you throw questions at me, um, you know, as we go along? Is that, is that cool? Do it that yeah. way? Yes, that sounds best. Okay. And then I'm particularly Good. interested in new buyer programs that you had mentioned in your flyer. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let me share. Oh, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. That is not gonna be good. So. I show, Tom, I show Tom Conrad as the host. Oh, you know how Tom is. <laughs> let me see if I can get Tom. Hey, Tom, how are you? Hey, listen, I'm doing this uh, Zoom call for Mortgage 101, and it shows you as the host, and it says the host has to enable screen sharing. Um, who, who's actually running this? I know it ain't you. <laughs> Probably Imani. All right, let me see if it's Imani. I'll call her. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Don't you guys love this? Huh. It's not Damn my fault. There.
Hey, Imani, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm fine. Are you the host for this Zoom call? Um, no, it's, it's a call. Yeah, and he said he doesn't know anything about it. I just called him. I have to do a screen share. I have to do a screen share to show them. I mean, I can talk about it, but I thought I would give them a graphic so they could look at. Okay. No problem. No problem. Thank you so much. I'll I'll just I'll dazzle them with something witty. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Uh, really, that was a lie. I don't think I've got anything witty for you guys. So, um, let me uh, let me give you a little bit of background about how the loan process works. How about that? So here's what would happen. So many of the agents in the office have a scripted email where they greet the client. They sometimes will talk about the next time they're going to meet and they say, as promised, I want to introduce you to one of my favorite lenders. He's CC'd on this email. Uh, Reed Clark is a, a great lender. We do a lot of business with, um, he'll be connecting with you. And that's the kind of the handoff for us to reach out to the client. Now, what I want to tell you guys, especially you new ones is that many times, if you just tell your client, hey, uh, call this loan officer, a lot of times that won't happen. But if you will actually have, say, hey, can I have my guy call you? We will call them, I promise you. We'll be reaching out to them, you know, three to five times trying to get them. So that's actually a better method to actually get the handoffs and get the process started. Once we've got uh, gotten the client engaged, we offer them two options. Um, either they can do my online application at reedclark.com, and sometimes you can actually just direct them there too, or of course, we'll do it verbally over the telephone. Either way, we're going to circle back and engage with them on the telephone so that we can actually build that personal connection with them. We want them to feel really comfortable, and we're going to go over their situation. Uh, if they qualify, we'll talk to them about you know their options, and then we'll send them a pre-approval letter to you and to them you as the realtor and them as the client. Another thing that we're all, we do offer is something called Silverton Secure. And I would recommend that you guys consider that right now because one, um, one of the biggest issues that y'all are gonna deal with is multiple offer situations. And some of you guys are selling right now and you can nod your head to say that is, I mean, that is what it is. Ivan, I don't know, have you dealt with that a good bit? Yeah, I actually have um, this. It seems like uh, if you have a nice property and good location, you're going to deal with that. Yeah, it can't be helped. Yeah, I've heard of some of them. Some people having 20 to 30 offers on a house. So when that happens, you've got to either compete by offer more money than everybody else, which is not what you want to do, or to try to offer better terms. So Silverton Secure, to put it briefly, is a complete full underwrite up front. So that, um, okay, thank you, Imani. Mm -hmm. um, so that you can go in not with a pre-approval letter, but with a fully underwritten loan. And sometimes that'll make the difference, make you stand out from the other people. It's called Silverton wow. Secure. Wow. Now, is that a cost to the no. client or no, is sir. that? Nope. All no we cost. do, Joseph, is like whenever we treat the file at the pre-approval stage, like they're going under contract, if the client that is agreeable, to the buyer. and we will, um, we just we gather all the docs and we send it through the process, send it through underwriting, just as though it was a live contract. We just do it with a TBD address, and then you can make an offer without a financing contingency and things like that. It it can be very helpful, and we're doing a lot of those right now. Any advantage of help at this point? At this yeah, part? tell me about it. <laughs> Reed, I mean, how long does that take to um, to put together hey, on Kathy, your end? Um, we, it, it doesn't take that long. We're at, right now, we're at 24-hour turn times in underwriting, which is wonderful. Excellent. Um, especially compared to what last year was like. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, you're, it depends really on how responsive the client is. Like, if you had a client that I engaged with today, and let's say tonight they uploaded their documents, we're going to disclose that loan tomorrow on a TBD address 
Jeannie or Marion is going to reach out to the client. They're going to review the docs that the client uploads, reach out to them tomorrow and find out, you know, tell them what they're still lacking. As soon as those docs are in, it's going to be handed off to Lisa or Mary, my processors. They're going to submit it to underwriting. So, I mean, theoretically, in a scenario like that, you'll have it by the end of next week. That is excellent because in this market, time is not on the buyer side. So that's great. Yeah. I tell you what, I'll give you guys a little script. And I don't know how y'all are, but I don't ever, I don't think I've ever had an original thought in my life. <laughs> I just happen to remember good stuff that I hear other people say. So I heard a guy say one time, he said, he tells his clients, he said, look, if you want to sleep on it, you won't sleep in it. So uh, that's huh. what's, that's true right now, right? Love it. <laughs> so yeah, that might be one you guys can use. It makes you look witty and clever, even if they don't bite on it, right? <laughs> so, all right. So let me share my screen with you guys and please just jump in at any point that you uh, have a question and this, I'd like this to be as interactive as we can. So you guys can see my uh, flyer now, right? Mortgage 101. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, all righty. So what we'll start with is FHA. FHA loans, um, came about in, I believe, the 30s, 1930s, and they were created because the government felt like that a priority for a healthy country was home ownership. And I tend to agree with that. I think people who are invested and own their own homes, there's a sense of uh, participation in the, in the bigger system of our country. It gives uh, stability. It enables people to uh, feel more settled and, and um, you know, just dig their roots down deeper plus the fact of the, the fundamental human need to have their own shelter. So FHA was a government, it's the Federal Housing Administration. And prior to that time, the individual banks, were, uh, local banks were the ones who made home loans. So how many of you guys have seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Well, that Damn. was an Damn. early version of a savings and loan association. And those yeah. were about the only entities that um, made home loans. But the problem was that you had to have at least 20% down to buy a house. Well, FHA came along and said, tell you what, we will allow people to make buy houses with, and right now it's three and a half percent down, and, and the government will actually insure the loan so that whoever it is who is servicing the loan will not hold the loss if the person doesn't pay. So that's kind of where FHA came along. Now, FHA has broader underwriting parameters than any than other types of loans. Uh, you can have a lower credit score. Right now, we can do FHA loans down to a 600 credit score. You can have a higher uh, debt-to-income ratio. I have done FHA loans with a debt-to-income ratio as high as 56%. Now, let me tell you what that means. Debt-to-income ratio for a mortgage is all your monthly indebtedness, including the new house payment, divided into your gross pay, gross pay. Now, if you think about that, 56% of your gross pay, you don't have a whole lot left. Because I don't know what percentage of your, of most people bring home of their gross pay, maybe, I don't know, maybe 80% after taxes and homeowners, I mean, uh, health insurance and all those sorts of things. Social Security. So if somebody is qualified maxing out on debt to income ratio for an FHA loan, there's not a lot of margin in their life. But they can get a loan. So sometimes when I hear people talk about the lack of access to mortgages, I'm going, man, y'all need to you need to do a little more research because there's a lot of people that that do get loans that probably will be good paying borrowers but you wouldn't loan your own money in that situation. So it's pretty broad underwriting guidelines to be able to get an FHA loan. Now there's some, somebody say something. Yeah, I had a question, Estacia. Yeah. As far as the gross pay part of it, if the new home buyer is you know, looking at their gross pay, what is included in that? Is it, if it's a, if it's a married couple, let's say, and do they both have to be on a loan and then the gross pays both of theirs or yes, they're both how are on the loan. Yes, whoever whoever is on the loan, whoever can qualify to be on the loan, they're both of their 
incomes are added. Now, but if, if only credit, one person is, if it's only one person that's eligible to be on the loan, it, but they both are working, would both of their income uh, be in there? No, okay. just the uh, just the borrower, the borrower. Okay. So sometimes we have to help people, like you know, somebody may have to get their credit score up or something like that to be able to be on the loan. Gotcha. Perfect. Okay. Uh, three and a half percent down payment, typically. There is, um, there are two types of PMI. Is everybody familiar with what, is there anybody that's not familiar with what PMI is? Private mortgage insurance, okay. So there's two types of PMI on an FHA loan. There's a monthly PMI and there's an upfront lump sum PMI. It's an upfront mortgage insurance premium. The upfront mortgage insurance premium is 1.75% of the uh, loan amount and it's financed into the loan. It can be paid separately, but I've rarely ever had anybody do that. So it's financed into the loan. So if you think about that, what that means is you've got, um, if somebody buys a house and they finance 96.5% of it, and then they add in 1.75 on top of that, so immediately, the day they close, 96.5, 96.5 plus 1.75, they owe 98.25% of the value of that house the day they close. So they're going to need to stay in that house for a while before they can sell it and pay real estate commissions and come out ahead. Yep. Now... The monthly PMI right now on an FHA loan is permanent. Back in probably 2012, I would say, the guideline changed. It used to be that when, a, when the person paid down their loan and they got to the point that they owed 80% of the value of the house or less, the PMI went away. That still happens on conventional loans and it used to happen on FHA loans. Now it doesn't. FHA loans, the PMI is permanent. As long as they have that loan, they're going to pay monthly PMI. We, we in the industry, when that happened, we couldn't believe it, that the government changed the guideline like that. But they did. So that there's actually taught that that's going to be changed, that the FHA, the FHA monthly PMI won't be permanent anymore, and it will go away. And I think that's a good thing. Just morally, it's a good thing. The loan amount in most of the counties that you guys will be dealing with is $412,850. Now you can get a fine house for $412,000. The other thing that sometimes makes FHA uh, desirable is, is the waiting period after a bankruptcy or foreclosure is shorter. So somebody, you know, if they had a bad event in their life, they can get into an FHA loan quicker than they can get into a conventional loan. Interest rates on FHA loans are good. So it's not a bad loan other than the fact that you got that 1.75% uh, financed fee and you've got the permanent PMI. Other than that, it's pretty good. It's a decent loan. Any questions on FHA? You can hey, uh, go ahead. Reed, so uh, with the PMI is the only way to get rid of it, I guess, later on would be to refinance the home? Right now. Okay. Unless, now, I've been, if somebody puts 10% down on an FHA loan, it does go away after 11 years. Okay. But, I mean, not too many people are putting 10% down on FHA loans. I actually have one right now, believe it or not. But um, it's not a real common, uh, common thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but that, you're right. That is, right now, until the law changes, that's um, that's the way it is. Okay. Now I will let me let me throw in I, let me in defense of FHA and that government decision. FHA has higher um, delinquency rates and and there's a higher rate of losses on those loans than there are on other loans, typically because it's lower credit scores and things like that. And so the reason I think that they made the PMI permanent was they needed to be recapitalized in FHA because they do, lose, they do lose money from people, you know, losing, not being able to pay on their houses and stuff like that. So that was their rationale was, we need to keep this steady inflow of mortgage insurance coming in. But just because the need's there, I don't necessarily think it's right. That's my opinion. 
So. Hey, Bree, this yep. is Angela Loft. Um, why do some, I've been looking at condos and townhomes for a client. Why do some um, prevent you from having an FHA loan? Great, great, <laughs> great question. Thank you, Angela. I could have almost paid you to ask that question. That was a good one. Townhouses are not an <laughs> issue. I'll send you my Venmo, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Townhouses are not an issue. Now, guys, I don't know if you've been selling any, you, you found out that knowing the difference between a townhouse and a condo, sometimes that is a tricky proposition to try to figure out which it really is. But if it's truly a condo, Angela, it has to be on uh, the FHA's approved condo list. And what happens a lot of times with a condo development, especially one that's not, you know, a super expensive one is when they build them, they go through the hoops of getting on the FHA list. But the FHA approval expires after so many years. And a lot of times all the units are sold and the um, homeowner association just doesn't go through the hoops of getting it uh, reapproved. So if you're showing condos to an FHA client, you're going to want to call me and make sure that I give you the link or either look it up for you to make sure that the particular condo development you're looking at is on the list. But there are specific criteria that condos need to meet for financing, and that's why FHA has that list. On conventional loans, the individual, each individual loan is analyzed by the underwriter to make sure that it meets the right criteria, but FHA maintains a master list. But townhouses are not an issue. Great question. All right, I'll move on to USDA loans. You probably guys are not going to deal with a whole lot of this. I've probably done eight or 10 of these my whole, the whole time I've been doing mortgages. Those are out in rural areas. Uh, it's 100% financing. It is um, geographically restricted, like I said, to rural areas. It has income limitations, uh, it's a, but it is 100% financing. I mean, it's a good loan for the right person in the right location. And there is a, a map online where you can see which areas do qualify for USDA financing. So if you ever run into that, just reach out to me and we can do a little a quick refresher and we can, I can give you the link to the map so you can uh, look up the properties. Are, are there any caps to those loan amounts, Reed? Yes, there are. And I don't know what they are right now. I'll be honest with you. I haven't looked, I haven't looked up the max. Um, it's certainly not any higher than FHA. And my guess is it's probably lower. Thank you. The issue on that is probably more the income limitations. I mean, because if somebody's really wanting to buy a, an expensive house, they probably make too much money uh, to qualify for USDA anyway. VA loans are next. I love VA loans. And if you get a client who has VA eligibility, please send them our way. We're good at them. Um, we don't charge any lender fees on our VA loans. And that's a $1,295 savings right off the bat. Um, there's no processing, no underwriting. There's no lender fees at all on our VA loans. And right now you're looking at interest rates in the mid twos. I mean, it's just hard to beat. So if I was a veteran, it's probably what I would be using. So like I said, a VA loan, uh, they're insured by the Veterans Administration. It's 100% financing. Uh, there's no monthly PMI. Um, like it says on the sheet, there's limited to eligible service members or a surviving spouse. The VA funding fee, that's the, that's the equivalent of uh, FHA's upfront mortgage insurance but the VA funding fee is a one-time fee. It's financed into the loan. Now that can be pretty pricey. Like right now, the fee for a subsequent use, if somebody's used their VA eligibility to before and they're using it again, uh, that's 3.6% of the loan amount financed in. So you can imagine, you know, if you're talking about a $400,000 loan, you're talking about almost a $15,000 fee that's going to be um, financed into the loan, but there's no monthly PMI. And the interest rates are low. If the veteran has more than 10% service-related disability, they don't have to pay that fee. 
So that's where it really even becomes better. Um, again, it's, it's a great loan. Um, I, it's just, you know, if you go over $548,250 for the loan amount, they do have to start making a little bit of a down payment. But so if you get a VA client, just call me and let's talk through that. I don't want to get out in the weeds right now on how, on how we calculate that. But uh, it's just a fantastic loan. Does anybody have any questions about VA loans or comments of your experience with them? Okay. Okay, conventional loans. So that is your basic Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan. Um, it requires a slightly higher credit score. I think probably if you're not, if you're in the 660s, then we're probably going to start looking at an FHA loan, maybe. Now, if you're putting 20% down and there's no PMI, then, you know, we'll stay with a conventional loan. Um, but it does have, need a, a slightly higher credit score. Uh, it will, it requires a lower debt to income ratio. But right now, many times we can go up to a 49.99. And I'm telling you guys, that's a, that's a substantial portion of somebody's income to qualify for a loan. Um, down payments are as low as 3% on a conventional loan. The PMI does go away once the um, value, the amount of the loan is less than 80% of the home's value. And the, income, the loan limits have been raised this year. And in our metro area, they're $548,250. Now, anything over that goes into the next category, which is jumbo. So the conventional loan limit right now in the metro area is $548,250. And, you know, again, if you don't put 20% down, you're going to have monthly PMI or a single premium PMI, depending on which the client chooses. You also can have a non-occupying co-borrower on a conventional loan, just like FHA. You can have, let's say somebody wants to buy a house and they can't quite qualify, but their dad is willing to uh, go on the loan with them. And we can certainly do that. And gift funds are available on um, virtually all of these loans, uh, they can be gifted uh, money for the down payment, the closing costs, and things like that. Sellers can also pay, contribute toward the closing costs on all these loans. Any questions on that? Okay, and then the last category would be jumbo loans. Jumbo loans are loans that are over $548,250. So jumbo loans, you're probably gonna be limited to about a 43% debt to income ratio. Uh, you're gonna need a higher credit score. In most cases, at least a 700. And you're gonna have to have reserves. You're gonna have to have other assets besides what you're using for the uh, purchase which makes, makes sense, right? And then a higher down payment required. We do have a 90% uh, jumbo loan. Most of the time when we're doing jumbos, we see people putting 20% down, but you can do a, a decent loan with 10% down. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna, there's one more that I'm gonna, one other type of loan that I'm gonna talk about too, but is there any question about jumbos? I know you guys want to be, doing jumbo loans, because that means you're selling expensive houses. That is kind of the goal. Yes. Thank you. There, y'all are awake over there. I should make you turn your cameras on so I can tell who's still awake. But anyway, <laughs> um, here. my sister, my We're daughter here. had a, uh, my, my daughter had a, um, you know, she's at UGA and everything's virtual. And the other night she had a, a test and she was here at the house and it was like, okay, you turn your camera on. Nobody else can be in the room. It was like lockdown, man. They basically had to sit there and stare at the screen. And if they didn't, the teacher was like messaging them and asking them what was going on. It was crazy, but we won't do that to y'all. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about real briefly is our construction and renovation loans. Now, this is something that many lenders don't have 
And a few years back, Silverton decided that that was a product that we needed to offer. And what we did was we hired the guy who had run the construction loan program at SunTrust for years. So we got a guy who knew what he was doing. He had been, that's what all he had been doing for 30 years. So that's who runs our construction of firm and renovation loan uh, program. So if you've got a client who uh, thinks that they want to buy a piece of property and build a house, we would love to help with that. More likely though, you're going to have a client who finds a house that has the right bones in the right location, but it needs work. We can help you with that. And that can get you a transaction. If you've got this knowledge in your hip pocket, you can save a transaction. So rather than your client going in and saying, man, this, this is the school district we want. And I really like the way this house looks, but man, it needs so much work on the inside. Rather than them turn around and walking out, you can say, well, now hang on a minute. What if we get a contractor over here to walk through with you and get an idea of what needs to be done? And I've got a lender who does renovation financing and we can do that for you. Um, that, that's something for you guys to know. And I'll give you as much detail now as you want, or I'll just let you know that the program's out there, whatever's best. I, I don't want to be answering questions you're not asking. So you guys you let hit, me know. Can you hit the high points? Sure. Uh, of the renovation? Yes, please. Okay. So what would happen is, first of all, your client's going to um, determine whether the stuff that needs to be done is like purely cosmetic or if it's kind of a bigger deal and it's structural. Now, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to Rick, who runs our construction department, to determine, hey, this is, this is more work than just cosmetic. But let's say that it's countertops, HVAC, flooring. Well, in that case, we're probably not going to require that it be a licensed general contractor to do that work. In that circumstance, we would actually get the written estimates from the service providers, and then we would review it. So, and then we would send the appraiser out to appraise the house subject to those renovations. So he's going to come back and tell us, hey, when, once they've done those three things that you said, this house is going to be worth X. And that's what we're going to base the loan amount on. So in that case, like when you're, your client is not only worried about the purchase price of the house, he's also worried about whether it's going to be worth enough after it's fixed, you know, to justify borrowing the money for the renovations also. And then we would disperse the money as the work is done. We'd send an inspector out to make sure that the new HVAC is in and functional. And we would send the inspector out to make sure that, um, you know, the kitchen has been renovated and the floors are in and that sort of thing. Hey, Regina. Hey, about three or four years ago, your former company um, gave my sister a better loan on new construction than the builder was offering. Um, so you can compete with new construction because I know builders push that. Can you comment a little on that? Yeah, I will. I'll, let me Thank let you. me touch. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that was actually the next thing I was going to talk about. So let me I'm going to come back to that one, Regina. Um, what? So that was the basics of the renovation loan. And now here's what happens on a renovation or a construction to perm loan is you have, there's two phases of that loan. There's one closing, but there's two phases. There's the construction phase, and then there's the permanent phase of the loan. So what we're going to do is we're going to close the loan. And let's say that your renovations are going to take six months. And I've got a couple of recently that have taken that loan. The client is going to pay interest only during the construction phase based on the amount of money they've used. Now we know that if you're buying a house to renovate, the initial amount that's going to be drawn on that line is the amount to pay off the seller, right? Because at the closing, we're going to pay the seller. And let's say the, the cost of the house was $200,000. And then after four, three weeks, the HVAC is done and we pay the HVAC guy, and now you owe 220. And then the kitchen and all is done, and it's 240. Well, as soon as we start getting close to the completion phase, we're gonna modify that loan into the permanent 30-year loan. It's not another closing, it's a simple modification. And the good thing about that is the client only has one set of closing costs. It's 
pretty much the same process if the client is buying a lot and building a house. We're going to re release the money during the process. They're going to pay interest just on the amount they use, and then it'll be modified to the permanent loan when all the work is completed. So that's, in a nutshell, the way okay. they work. What what are the what are the qualifications for for that loan? Uh, you got to have at least seven hundred credit score. Debt to income ratio can't be over forty three. Um, in general, that's it. We can do jumbo or or conventional loan limits. Okay, that's the the broad parameters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're seeing more of that right now with the scarcity of uh, of houses on the market. Now back to, did anybody have any other questions on those? I have a quick question for you. This is Allison Gale. Can I assume that, that those uh, construction and renovation loans are only due bundled, uh, available bundled to buyers and that you would not give that to someone who's just in a home and wants to do reconstruction? No, or absolutely. Absolutely you would? we do. The renovation loan is perfect for somebody who loves their house, but it needs some love. Okay, I have a lot of people who want to put money into it to fix it up, to sell it for a better price, but they don't have the money to do that. Would that be an instance that we could come to you? Well, that's a little different story because that's, they're going to, as soon as they finish, they're going to turn around and put it on the market. Right. That's not something that we would do. We would be doing it for somebody who plans, at least plans to stay in their house. Okay. Yeah. Right, now what, I, I'll, I'll, what we do on that is, you know, there's a couple of things. Let's say that Mr. Smith wants to sell his house next fall, but he's not done anything to it and he's still got harvest gold appliances and avocado green <laughs> bathroom fixtures. Some of y'all who were young may not have ever seen those, but they were quite a sight to behold. Um, well, he's gonna, you know, you're going in, Allison, as the, uh, as the realtor and you're saying, look, Mr. Smith, you know, we can sell it the way it is right now and get probably X, but if you'll do these five things, you're, you're, you're gonna get a lot more for your house. Well, he's gonna say, well, I don't have the money to do it. Well, here's what I would suggest to that person. I would go to Synovus and I would get a home equity line. Um, and other, other entities have them. I just, my own uh, home equity lines with Synovus, I know that it was a very a good process to get it. And let him go get a home equity line for $40,000, get that thing looking great. And then when he sells the house, you know, next October, he pays off everything he owes on the house. That's what I would do in a situation like that. Okay. Thank but you. this product doesn't work, doesn't work for that. Now, you know, I mean, some, if they're going to sell the house three years from now, or they know they're going to sell it, their daughter's in ninth grade, and they're going to sell it when she graduates. Totally. I mean, we can do that, but not something that's a short term like that. Makes sense. Thank hey, you. Reed. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> hey, it's Janice. Um, what are the interest rates on both of those, the equity line and the construction that you're home talking about? Lines, home equity lines are tied to prime, prime interest rate. And prime, I believe right now is four and a quarter, I think. Let me just see real quick. Three and a quarter. Sorry about that. So um, prime rate is currently three and a quarter. So most home equity lines are prime or prime plus something. Prime plus one, prime plus one and a quarter. So you're going to, and the reason that's like, for example, so that let's say the interest rate is prime plus one and a quarter, which puts it at four and a half. Okay, that's higher than your long term mortgage rates, but this is something that you're only using temporarily and you're going to be billed interest on it on it, interest only on it each month. It's a perfect tool for something like that. I wouldn't recommend this for somebody that's going to do an 80,000 renovation and then planning to pay the home equity line off over the next eight years. I wouldn't do that. I would get a fixed rate. I would get a new fixed rate mortgage because the interest rate on a home equity line is going to vary when prime changes. And I can tell y'all some point in the future, it's going up. It will be going up. 
And then the question you asked was on the um, construction and renovation loans. Uh, the interest rate in general on something like that is in the mid threes, between three and four. And, and that's rightfully so, because there's a bit more risk to a lender when they're lending on a home that we know is not complete or is in the middle of being renovated. Because if the buyer, if the owner walks, we got to go in and finish it. So that's why the interest rate on a construction loan is a bit higher. Plus there are a lot of moving parts behind the scenes to administer a renovation loan, you know, the draws, the inspections and all that sort of thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Reed, this is John. I also have a question. Um, could the construction loan be used to secure the lot as well as to develop the land? Yeah, it can. Now, the, the, the caveat on that, John, is that they need to be pretty much simultaneous. Okay. So in other words, if your client finds a lot, he's going to need to find plans in a builder in his next breath because we need so we to have close Go ahead. Because we need to close that all at one time. So I would say to somebody, write a 60 day contract on the lot and then get to work with your builder and your plans so that when we, because when we close it, we're paying the lot owner off at closing. And okay. then we're going to set up the construction um, line, you know, at closing from that point forward. Got it. So we've identified a builder. We're just trying to find a lot. So I'll get with you offline and, and, and get some information over to you for the buyer. Yeah, that's great. And that's exactly, that's a, a really a good scenario. If you already know, if you, if you know kind of what you want to build and you know who's going to build it, you've really got a lot of the, of the legwork done. That's the time consuming part, really. It can be right there is trying to figure out what you want to build and who's going to build it and then getting the cost and the estimates and a, and a contract down on paper. Got it. Good. Thanks. Sure. So back to the question that Regina asked a little while ago, she asked about um, financing for new construction. So here's the way that stuff works. Builders typically have their lines of credit with a bank. Let's say that, and I'm gonna make this up. Let's say that Reed Clark Construction Company, I'm building my big subdivision out here and I've got my construction loan is with Bank South. Well, I can promise you, Bank South is gonna have a loan officer attached to me. And part of my agreement with Bank South is that I have to pay closing costs for the buyers if they use Bank South's loan officer. So that's kind of the way that works. Now, what I'm gonna do is say, well, shoot, I'm not taking it out of my pocket. I'm gonna build it into the cost of the house. So if I'm paying 5,000 of closing costs, only if they use a Bank South loan officer, I'm gonna bump the price of my house up $5,000. Now, what sometimes happens is if you, it depends on the relationship between the builder and the mortgage company. Sometimes if you play hardball, the builder will agree to pay closing costs for a different mortgage company. But right now they've got so many people wanting to buy their houses, they don't have a whole lot of incentive to do that. So the best thing that you can do is to tell your client, hey, I've got a great loan officer, uh, Reed's already pre-approved you, and this is what happens. You know, um, Allison sends me a client and I pre-approve them, maybe help them fix their credit, uh, all this kind of stuff when we get them ready to go and they go out and look at houses and they end up in a new construction subdivision and all of a sudden they're saying, Reed, they want to use you, but the builder's giving them $5,000 to use their lender. <clears throat> Here's what I do. I'll say, Allison, I understand that. Don't go on it. But I understand it. Tell them to get a written quote and send it to me and let me see what it looks like. And there have been many times that we can match a few times even do a little bit better or get close to what they're being offered by the builder's lender. And I've got a guy, that's a perfect question for today. I've got a guy who his, he has an elderly dad who lives in Savannah and the guy had been turned down for a loan 
and we got him financed last year and they were so grateful. I mean, Fletcher wrote us a, a, an email about how grateful he was. Well, now his son lives up here and he's buying a house. And y'all, I'm not kidding you. He sent me the quote from the other lender and I sent him my quote and I said, I said, John, I got to tell you, it's going to cost you more money to go with me. I said, with the amount of money they're giving you, this is as close as I can get. And I just got to be honest with you. I need to tell you. And he came back to me yesterday and said, you know what? It is a little more with you. He said, but we're going to go with you because of the way you treated our family. He said, and we're going to be, uh, the, there's other family members who are going to need a loan in the future. And I was like, wow, because I'm going to be honest with him. I'm telling you guys, I am not going to try to get somebody to use me if it's going to cost them more money. And I CC'd my whole team on the email that I sent to him when I told him, I said, John, it's going to cost you more money to go with me because I wanted my team to realize this is the way we do business. And all of a sudden he comes back and is going to use us. So that was just a kind of a quick story, an amazing story. But that's one thing you can be comfortable with, guys. If you if you follow this, those steps and have your client check with me, we're going to tell them the truth. And, and they're not going to, we're not going to strong arm them to use me if it's going to cost them more money. So that is kind of what Regina, in Regina's situation, we actually were better than what they were being offered by the builder's lender. Because sometimes all that happens is the other lender will raise their interest rate to be able to give the credit back to the client. So I have thrown a ton of information at you. And Reed, my sister is still enjoying that loan that y'all did for her. Thank you. Well, good for her. I'm glad. And I thank you, Regina. Reed, I have a question. Okay. In this multiple offer situation that we're dealing with, are the FHA and the VA going to be less appealing to a seller because of the um, possibility that the appraisal process is going to drag out? Right, let me let me later let me, in that's, the process. That's a really good question. Let me let me answer it this way. An FHA appraisal takes no longer than a conventional appraisal. An FHA appraisal is slightly more detailed Come out of there. than a conventional appraisal. There are some condition issues that might not be noted on a conventional appraisal that would be noted on an FHA appraisal. An FHA appraiser is gonna be looking for things such as um, rotted wood, broken windows. They call it health and safety issues, but it's broader than that. Um, let's say that on the deck, the balusters are, are too far apart. They're going to note that. They're going to note that if there's stairs going into the basement with no railing, it's got to be done. If there's a water stain on the ceiling, they're going to want to know if there was a roof leak. Uh, if there's a hole in the sheetrock or ripped up flooring, they're going to want it to be repaired. So in that respect, an FHA appraisal, if the house is in good condition, the seller doesn't have anything to worry about. And it's not going to take any longer. So I don't, I would, in general, on a good house, they should not be afraid of an FHA offer. VA is the same way in regard to condition, exactly the same way. VA, can, VA appraisals can take a little bit longer. I think the rule of thumb is that a VA appraiser has 10 business days to do the report from the time it's uh, ordered. But I'll tell you, I have not been seeing them take that long. There's a VA has a specific appraisers assigned to each county. And so the ones in Cobb and Cherokee, where I generally work, um, they're delivering their reports in a timely manner. So there is a bit of a stigma, Allison, about that. Um, I mean, if I had a if I had a conventional offer where somebody was putting 40 percent down, um, heck, I'd probably, you know, I'd probably jump on that over the other one because there is at least the potential that it would be an easier deal. But it, you, they are looked at differently, yes. And sometimes, though, I, I will tell you, sometimes I think they're looked at 
overly in an overly critical way. I, I think sometimes they're ruled out when, I mean, I've got, I got strong borrowers who are doing FHA loans. They just have to do FHA and they're going to, I mean, they're going to close on the loan. That's the only thing the seller wants. What's my price and are we going to close? So the, I'll tell you this. I think the lender has more to do with the, than the type of loan. If you know the lender who did the pre-approval letter, like I would hope I've actually you guys... shown prop... Go ahead. I said, I've actually shown properties and on the FMLS listings, it says we will not accept FHA offers. Okay. In my opinion, they gotta be careful with that, but, they, if, but there can be a legitimate reason for that. For example, if they know there's something wrong with the house that's gonna get snagged, on an FHA appraisal. Mm. I just feel like you almost Makes need sense. to explain that to avoid fair housing. Yeah, sometimes they've had an appraisal and don't want anyone else to, because they want over and above. I've, I've come into that. Fantastic point, because an FHA appraisal sticks with the house. The next person that comes along that wants to use FHA financing is bound to the first appraisal for uh, 120 days, I believe it is. So that's, that's exactly, yeah, but I, I think you, it's kind of dicey with fair housing when you say we're not going to accept an offer from this, if, uh, but I think there has to be a real reason and there could be. Any other questions? Well, it has been a privilege to, to uh, talk to you guys and I would love to help you anytime. I mean, I, we want to be a resource for you and either Tiffany, Tracy, Kathy, or I will be available to answer questions or to pre-approve your clients or do anything we can to help you guys succeed. Reed, I really appreciate this time. Thank Joseph, you so you're much, mighty Reed. welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you guys Thank for the you, privilege. Hey, Reed. Thank you. Hey, Reed, quick question. Yes, sir. Where can we get resources that we can include in like our buyer folders, maybe like some flyers with your contact info and the, some of the different programs that are available? Yeah, if you email me, um, okay. it's, Reed, it's Reed Clark at SilvertonMortgage.com. Heather, got it. Um, my assistant has got all that stuff and she'll probably try to fine tune it to what you need. There's stuff that we can co-brand, a lot of things that we can actually co-brand with you, uh, you know, some slick glossy flyers and things like that. So and also, too, just so you'll know, we do offer a thing called list reports. When you guys get a listing, make sure that um, you're connected with me on that because list report, if you're connected with me, as soon as your listing goes in FMLS, you'll actually get a link to a bunch of marketing materials, um, some great demographic areas about the neighborhood, uh, some pretty cool looking stuff. And also, uh, there's a... Um, there's some things in there for a listing presentation that you could use also. Awesome. Thanks, Reed. Thanks for everything. All right, y'all. Have a great day. Good luck. Thank you, Reed. Thank you. Thank you. See y'all.